Yeah, awesome. It's great to see you guys. We are in week two of our uh, Soil for Your Soul series. Uh, week two, um, talking about how we can have good soil for our soul, where our soul is going to be planted. So uh, to jump, I want to read just the full um, parable and uh, that we are going, we're going through parables throughout this, this series, parables that Jesus taught in the New Testament. And so I want to go ahead and read the whole parable real quick. We're going to be in um, Luke 18, Luke 18. And again, if you have the YouVersion app, you can, um, you can follow along on our notes on the YouVersion app. So here we go, starting in verse 9, Luke 18, here we go. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and, he, and scorned everyone else. So these are the people he's talking to. He says, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I am certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance, dared not even to lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And then Jesus said, I tell you this, the sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's the parable we're going to be studying today. Um, Again, as we talked about last week, man, we have this principle of life. You reap what you sow, right? And that's, that's kind of the, the setup to the series that, that what you and I do today, there will be a result later on. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. Sometimes we like that you reap what you sow, sometimes we don't like that you reap what you sow because you're living in the negative consequences of that reality. And that's kind of the idea of what we're kicking off with the series, going through different parables that Jesus taught. But the reality is that, yes, you and I reap what we sow, but also... God is a sower. And this was the kind of the idea last week. We said that, that God wants to sow his word, his wisdom, and his spirit into our lives so that you and I can reap the benefit. We want good things. We want peace and blessing and prosperity or whatever else kind of word you want to put over your own life. Like we want good things, right? But did you know God also wants good things for you and I? And that was what we talked about, that he is a good father. He is, in the parable we looked at last week, he, he, he is the, the farmer who wants a good crop. He wants good things for you and I and for our lives. But we have the choice of whether or not we're going to follow him or not. That's up to uh, you and I. He's there. He's available. He's ready to go. But the question is, are we going to lean in and are we going to reap what he wants to sow into our lives? And so um, through these parables, he, Jesus gave instructions. Look, if you want the blessing and the peace that you're looking for, if you will plant your soul in the soil, if you will, if you will live the way that I tell you, Jesus said, you will reap good things. And that's what this series is all about, what we're going through, that what Jesus promised is possible if we will live it out. We have um, the three little boys, um, one just turned five a couple days ago, five, seven, and um, almost nine now. And so we're in this, the phase right now is like sports everything. And so we go outside in the yard, it's football one day, we got a basketball goal for Christmas, so it's basketball one day, and the last like couple weeks has been baseball, and it kind of like alternates all the time, and uh, we were, it's, it's been baseball right now, and so, you know, as a good dad, a former stud athlete that I used to be, uh, for those that went to high school, you can laugh because, you know, that's not true, um, but I know a little bit, right, and so I'm trying to tell my kids, okay, I'll... Jake, is that me again? I thought we had this issue fixed, and then I, I, it's just me. I can't do it. All right, we'll keep going until, until you, you give me the signal, okay? The bat signal to switch mics. Um, but, okay, so back to baseball with the kids. So uh, I'm, I'm in the yard. I'm like, okay, all right, you know, square your shoulders, you know, because Judah, my little one, he wants to stand facing me. I'm like, no, you got to turn right. And then and so all my baseball people know, hands up, right? You know, bend your knees a little bit, you know, fast hands is what they say. And uh, I try to tell them that, hey, we got this really long bat, so I'm like, hey, choke up a little bit. But, they, you know, they all want to do their own thing. But I'm trying to tell them, like, listen, I'm a good dad, right? I know what's best for you in baseball. I, I, I know a be- I'm way smarter than you two at this phase of life, right? You'll get there one day. But they don't always want to do that. Whitaker, my middle one, uh, he wants to swing with one hand because that's what Bowser does on Mario Baseball. And so... <laughs> I'm trying to get him to understand, like, that's fun, but it's not going to lead to a good hit. You might get lucky, which he's done a couple times, but it's better with two hands. And so I try to tell him, and then they'll get in their stance, right? And then as soon as I go to throw it, they'll just get back into however they want to do it. And it's like, okay, you're learning. But out of, they wouldn't say it this way, but it's out of pride. I know what I want. 
I, I know better than daddy, right? Out of pride, I'll go back to doing it my way. And you and I do the same thing with God, that our good father who's like, hey, look, if you would stand this way and hold the bat this way, and if you would swing this way, if you would live this way, if you would talk and walk and live this way, better things are coming for you because as the creator of the universe who created your soul and designed life, I know what's best. That's what God, our good father, would tell us. But we so often will say, no, no, I got this, God. I'm good. I I know how I want to swing. One hand is way more fun. But it doesn't always add up. But we do the same thing. Rather than humbly following God's wisdom for our lives, we exercise pride and choose to do things on our own way. And it's not always necessarily like rebelling and running away from God. It's just like, no, I know what's better. I know how to dictate and schedule my life, God. I know what will feed my soul more than you do. Sometimes it is rebelling and we want nothing to do when we run the opposite way. We just did a whole series about that, right? And sometimes we go through those seasons where it's like, God, I want nothing to do with you. But sometimes it's kind of like we tiptoe the other line and we're just like, we'll just walk parallel with God, but not like with God. We'll like, we'll just keep doing our thing our way and live a good life. And it's really easy to justify that because we look at other people and we're like, man, I'm... I haven't blown my life up like them, you know. It's like, so I'm not doing too bad, God. Like, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'll, I'll keep doing things my way. But the root of it, the root of it is pride to say, I'll, I'll figure this out on my own. I'm not going to walk in humility and fear the Lord, as Scripture says, and really revere Him and follow the way of Jesus as He taught to do. And so we choose our way instead of His way with our time and our habits with our money and our generosity, with our relationships, we do this in every aspect of our life, walking in pride instead of walking in humility. The pride is never the soil for our soul that will lead to good things. And that's what we see in this parable today that we're going to break down and kind of walk back through. It starts back at verse 9. Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness, and they scorned everyone else. They had great confidence. This is the target audience. You know, Jesus has a topic he's going to teach everybody about humility, but he's really trying to get the attention of those people who are like very confident, great confidence in their their own self, how good I am. Look at me. I haven't blown things up. I'm not doing too bad. Things are going pretty good. This is his target audience that he's trying to speak to. Now, in, in other translations where it says scorned everyone else, It'll say it's the people who look down upon others, the people who judge others, uh, the, the, the people who uh, treat others with contempt, treat others poorly, speak bad to or about them, because I'm so good that I can judge you. And what we see right off the bat here is that judging people out of pride is never approved by Jesus, okay? So this isn't like the full point of teaching, but it is a, is a pretty big part of it. Uh, judging people out of pride is never approved by Jesus. It's never, well, I'm good and you're bad, so I'm going to judge what you do because it makes me feel better or because I just think I see what I know and I, you know, so I'm just going to write you off. I am going to judge you and assume the worst out of you. And my, my heart is not to build you up. My heart is to tear you down and to judge you. That is never approved by Jesus. Now, judging in certain contexts is okay. Um, when we see a brother or sister or a friend or a family member that we love, and we see, it's like, hey, I see fruit, I see actions, I, I witness this firsthand, and that's not good. Jesus would not want us to act or talk or live or, hey, what you're doing is not good for your soul. And so out of a love, out of care and concern for you, I'm going to go to you to say, hey, what I'm seeing is, is not, it's not good for your soul. This type of judging is, is different than like tearing down and judging. That's a conversation for another day, how do we judge the right way, right? But Man, there, there is a way we can do this well directly, not in public, not on Facebook, not talking to other people, but to that person. That's how we should care for people, to love them, to build them up. But Jesus is saying, listen, judging people out of pride is, is never a good thing. And that's the audience he's trying to get to, this root of pride. It's never a good thing. And, and we might think, well, I'm, I'm not a very prideful person. But we're going to get into this in a second. There's probably some, where, some, some, some areas of our lives where we've maybe tiptoed up to that line a little bit. We'll get there in a second. Some of y'all are comfortable now. Get ready. Here's the deal, though. The easiest way to know if we have any pride in us is by how we think and talk 
about other people. This is the easiest way to know. As soon as we ever have a thought about somebody, what we think about them or what we say about them, that's the easiest way to know, oh, there is still a little something in here. Still a little something in here because we, and this is, I mean, it's, it's the easiest way to express our pride. It's the easiest way to show it and to live it out. And Jesus is trying to say, listen, I've got better options for your soul. And so if you will walk in humility and not out of pride and not out of judgment, it will be better for you. It'll be better for you and for your relationships. That's what he's trying to teach and get across to us. And so, again, we might not think this is us at first. Well, I'm not very proud. I don't judge people. I don't talk about other people. I don't gossip. But let's just, let's just keep going. This is, this is good. So in verse 10, he continues, says, this is the actual story, okay? Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. And the other was a despised tax collector. Now, if you grew up in the church, this idea of a Pharisee, you might be familiar. Like, yeah, they were like the hypocrites. They were the, they were the church temple leaders. They were the, the religious ones who knew all the Old Testament scripture. And they were kind of the, the holy people, right? And if you're not new to the church, you don't really fully get the, the or if you are new to the church, if you didn't grow up in the church, then you may not get the full context of, of what what Jesus is really implying here, because the, the religious leaders, they were so self-righteous and so hypocritical, ironically, even though they were the ones who knew the most about God. They were the ones who least looked like Jesus. And so I wanted to, for a second, kind of break down what a modern-day Pharisee would look like for us. I was Googling some stuff, trying to find that, and so I, I found a couple of examples, and I kind of twisted them to kind of like make them fit a little bit for us today to understand and so at the root of it, uh, um, if I can give you a definition, then we're going to look at some examples. Uh, the, the, the idea, the, the heart of who Jesus is talking about here, a Pharisee is someone who, who knows the right rules, who in some way even lives the right rules, but they do it only hoping that people will think that they're, they're good. And while they're living the right way, in some aspect, they completely miss and overlook and don't care about the heart issues and the character flaws that God cares more about. And even though on the outside they're doing great, on the inside they are hypocrites who are, who are not following after God. And so here's what a modern-day Pharisee would look like, okay? Modern-day Pharisees think being a Christian is proven just by showing up to church. Because, again, it's about what I do and about how people view me. External, not internal. Pharisees practice their faith to try and impress people. So coming to church, um, being generous with certain things. That's, that's why I really am a Christian, because I want other people to see me as good, and I, want other pe- I care more about their opinions of what I look like rather than actually who I really am. Pharisees know what to say, but they don't do what they say. Walk the walk, talk the talk, that idea, right? They don't walk the walk. Pharisees let their opinions, their traditions, and their politics determine how they interpret the Bible. Maybe that one's just for me. Um, Odds are one of these might not feel comfortable for you because a lot of them didn't for me either. And that's how we know, oh, maybe there's a little bit of pride still in here. So, yeah, we'll come back to that one. Uh, Pharisees lack love for people in need. They don't have love for people. They have love for actions and looking the right way. But everything Jesus was trying to do was to help serve and love. He came to serve, as he said, not to be served. But Pharisees don't want that. They, don't lack, they lack love for people in need. Pharisees forgive themselves, but never forget other people's past. We remember those stories from, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, how many, how many years we want to keep going back, especially in a small town. Pharisees cover up sin instead of confessing and repenting. I'll justify what I'm doing rather than confessing and repenting and changing. And here's why. Pharisees, they get angry and offended if someone tries to call something out in their life. Because I don't, I don't want to confess. I don't want to repent. How dare you try to lovingly correct me because you care for me. 
And rather than caring for me, I'm just going to get mad. Rather than seeing your love for me, I'm going to get angry. And, and here's why. Because Pharisees don't repent of sin because they believe they don't have any serious sin to turn from. Their sin is all okay because it's not as bad. It's not as outlandish. It's not as crazy. It's not as wild as other people's. And good night if I don't do this. Is that just me? I justify me. I justify the things that I do because I'm not X. When God doesn't care about, he cares about that person, but he, for me, he cares about me. <laughs> That's my priority. Pharisees, lastly, read the Bible to learn something or check off a to-do list, not to be formed into living like Jesus at the end of the day. The Pharisees knew the Bible. It wasn't the Bible at the time. It was the Old Testament scriptures. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the laws. They knew the stories. They knew who Yahweh was. But they had head knowledge without having heart transformation. And for you and I, some of these things we got to wrestle with to say, man, am I, do I, ooh, does that one hit a little too close to home? Because that's the reminder that, oof, maybe that's where I am today. I do things for the wrong heart, the wrong reason. And again, we may not be a Pharisee by profession or title because you don't work for the church or you're not a pastor or however else you, I'm not a holy man. I'm just a regular old person. So when he says Pharisees, Jesus is not talking about me. Well, okay, he's not in some extent, but he's trying to get our attention and everything he said. And so we've got to make sure that we don't, um, hey, I'm exempt from this because he's talking about Pharisees. No, no, no. Those resonate with us because we are so close to that. We're so close to that. And so Jesus is saying, hey, look, we've got these two guys. One's a Pharisee. One's a tax collector. Now, tax collectors, let's, let's again, same thing. Let's break it down because I, get, I think we hear that idea. It's like, okay, tax collectors were, were hated, but why were they hated? And so I want to do the same thing. But first, let me, let me kind of spell it out if you don't fully understand the cultural context. Okay, tax collectors were considered traitors to Israel. So again, Rome occupied Israel historically, okay? Rome was in charge. They taxed them. They were their rulers. They governed them. And so as people who were not Romans, they hated them. It's like, you know, taxation without representation, that whole thing. Like America has lived that, right? And so that was where the Jewish people were. And so tax collectors were Jewish people chosen by the Romans to tax other Jewish people. So they were considered traitors. Everyone hated them because now you are working for the man, right? You're working for the government. You're taking what's mine. And on top of that, the tax collectors, their salary was made up by on how much extra they took off the top. And so if you owe me $10, I'm going to charge you 12 and that two's coming to me and the 10's going to the man. And that's kind of how it functioned in a way. And so some people really took advantage of that. They got really rich and they lived really lavish lifestyles and they were really living it up they, and they didn't even act like Jewish people. And so in every sense of it, it's like you betrayed us, you took advantage of us, and now you're acting like these other people. You're not even acting like a Jewish person. And so that's culturally the context of, like, they hated tax collectors, these fellow Jewish people that Jesus is teaching to. It's like they, they despised every part of them. And so here's what we need to understand as we read through this and understand the story of what Jesus is teaching. That tax, tax collectors, modern day, this is how we would view them. They are unloved by all. That means enemies or just acquaintances and coworkers and neighbors, but even your friends and your family. A lot of times family would disown their kids if they became tax collectors because I want nothing to do with you. You're, you're bad on the name. You're bad on the weaver name, right? Like that's, that's the idea. So I'm going to disassociate with you. I can't stand you. Unloved by all. Tax collectors, this is the, the way to think about it. Again, we just kind of broad scope here. They are the hypocrites, the sinners, the strugglers, the addicts, the outcasts, and the overlooked. Maybe you can think of another one that I didn't think of to put in there. Not a good group of people to be considered with. And as you think about that today, in the church or in the world today, that's who the tax collectors are. The tax collectors are seen as unclean and unworthy by everyone, including themselves, because deep down they know this isn't right. Tax collectors have a past that everyone remembers and never stops talking about. Tax collectors live in shame and guilt because they hate their lifestyle, but they can't or they won't stop. And so they're, they're filled with shame and guilt. And lastly, tax collectors deep down are desperate for change. And today, I, I think that would be the same for those 
And maybe, maybe just maybe there's one person in the room that feels that, that shame, that guilt, the, the hypocrite, sinner, struggler, addict, outcast, overlooked. Maybe something along those lines describes you. And, it, and again, these stories are easy to distance ourselves from because it's like, well, I'm not a Pharisee and I'm not a tax collector and I don't live over there. But when we think about it in those terms, odds are you relate to one of those extremes. And, and here's what's really important. We'll go, come back to it at the end, but Jesus died, ready, for both the tax collector and the Pharisee. And so whatever your struggle or your sin or your past is, whether it's out of pride or it's out of, out of full of shame and guilt because of how you've been living, Jesus died for you, for, I, for, my, for myself, he, for us in our junk, no matter what our junk looks like. And so with all of that in mind, context, let's keep going. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. The cheaters, the sinners, the adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector, right? Calls him out, points him out because everybody knows he's bad. He shouldn't even be in the temple. He shouldn't even be in the church. I fast twice a week. Look at me. I give you a tenth of my income. Look at me. And right away, we see nothing but pride. Not a good place for our soul to be planted. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. You see this man living out of nothing but pride, and it is not good for your soul. And ironically, you see it in this man's spiritual life, in his prayer. Look at how good I am. And it's, it's rooted in a spiritual discipline, but it's also rooted in pride, and that does not add up. It doesn't make any sense to sit there in prayer and brag about yourself. And now, we probably don't do that today, but man, we, we do that in other ways of how we view and how we judge people. We wouldn't say it in our prayers, but man, thank you. I'm not like, it's just, oh, imagine like, that's, that's what Jesus is trying to get us to say. And as a side note, he wants us to realize that prayer is not a place to brag, but it's a place to be broken. It's, and if the only bragging actually, I, you could, I could correct this now that I think about it out loud, would be bragging on who God is and what he's done, right? Thank you that you haven't given up on me. God, you are good. You are where you brag on him. We don't brag on ourselves, but it's a place to be broken, to say, man, I, I, I might be better than I was yesterday, but man, I still got some work to do. God, thank you that you have not given up on me because I need your presence. I need your Holy Spirit to lead me and to guide me, to give me wisdom and discernment and direction. I need your comfort. I need your care. I need your clarity, whatever like you that's what we need from God in prayer, a place to be broken, to say, I don't have what it takes. I am not good enough, and I need you, Father. I need you. And that's exactly what the opposite of the religious person displayed. The religious person showed pride in his prayer, but yet the tax collector, the broken one full of shame, showed the opposite. And what's crazy is, what's crazy is, is this man who practiced all these good habits, these spiritual disciplines, if you've heard that, the spiritual habits, the spiritual practices. He fasted. Hey, fasting is a great thing to do. He, he gave a tithe. Tithing is biblical and it's a command. Giving back to God what he has first given to us is a command. And he shows up to the temple to pray. He's living a good, quote unquote, life, yet nothing in his posture is right. His heart has not been transformed. He's full of pride because it's not beneficial for our souls. And so he continues in the story in verse 13, he says, but the tax collector, the polar opposite of the, of the Pharisee, right? He stood at a distance and he dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. Like I, you just imagine this person, this is the one that slips into church really late Leaves a little early because they don't want to see him. They sit hopefully in the back. Maybe the lights are off today and no one will talk to me. I don't belong here. People will judge me. People will write me off. And I hope you don't feel that in this church, right? But like that's, that's this guy. He won't even, he's praying. He won't even, it's like um, talking to my kids when they make a bad choice, right? Um, hey, you're a good, you're a good boy. That's what I tell them, but you made a bad choice. So let's talk about it. They won't even look me in the eyes. Well, this is what I did, and even literally this morning, the kids are playing the switch down there, and one of them threw his controller down because he got mad at his brother, literally like an hour ago. So I had to pull him aside, hey, why'd you do this? We don't do that. We don't we use words. We don't throw things down, right? But he wouldn't look at me in the eyes because he like, just feels that shame and that guilt. And that's where this man is with God. He won't even look at him because he knows how broken he is. He's got nothing to brag about, but he is so broken before God. 
He stands at a distance. He won't even look at him and beating the chest. That was symbolic in that time. Like, golly, I'm just a terrible person. God, I need your help. And you hear that heart cry. Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I have nothing without you. I am a hypocrite. I'm an addict. I'm an overcast. I'm a struggler. Fill in the blank. And I am that last one, as we said, I am desperate for a change. I am desperate for a change. And, and what does Jesus say next? I tell you this, the sinner, this hypocrite tax collector that you and I judge, or maybe that where you are today, Jesus said, that's the one, not the Pharisee, but it's the hypocrite, the sinner, the tax collector who returned home justified, made right, forgiven, shown love by God. That's the one, the one who everybody else hates, the one who everybody else looks down upon. He is the one who returned justified before God. For those who, again, those who exalt themselves, who live out of pride, they will be humbled. But those who what? Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus is trying to teach you and I something about the state of our soul and the state of our lives and, and the, the future for the rest of our lives, that if we stay grounded and planted in humility, it is the best place to plant our soul is in humility. It is the best place to live from. It is better for me. It is better for my relationships. It's better for everything that I do if I stay grounded and rooted in humility. Humility helps me love people as God loves people. Humility helps me love the tax collectors as God loves the tax collectors. Humility keeps me from becoming like the Pharisee. There we go. Humility keeps me grounded that I don't have it all figured out, and I'm nobody special. Humility helps me live open-handed with love and patience and kindness because I realize God has loved me with love and patience and kindness. Mike too, Jake. Um, that's what humility does. Hum humility keeps me in a position that says, I, I don't have this figured out. And without God, I never will. And without God, I'm going to blow up my life. And I'm going to look like this or I'm going to look like that. And that's what he is trying to teach us, that the best soil to plant our soul in is humility. Now, what's crazy and what I love about this is that this is not a new theme. And if you're like day two of the church, you're like, oh, yeah, you probably... Humility, that's a pretty standard virtue for everybody regardless. Jesus was teaching nothing new. This is all throughout the Old Testament as well. It's all throughout Scripture. And I, what I love about this is that Isaiah 55, 700-something years before this, he, he, God spoke these words, this idea of almost where we started our service today. In verse 8 and 9, he said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And this is what humility recognizes. A prideful person will say, no, 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 I know how to hit a baseball bat with one hand like I want to, right? That's what pride says. I will live my life how I want to. I will treat people. I will talk about people. I will judge people. I will write people off. I'll hold on to their past stories. I won't forgive people. I'll live in bitterness. I will live selfish. That's what pride does because we think we know what we want. I'll live this way. But a humble person realizes that, man, God has a better way. As our good father, as the creator of our souls and the creator of the universe, he knows what's best for you and I. And at the core of our soul is staying grounded in humility because a humble person realizes that. A humble person realizes and they'll take his advice. They will listen to him. They'll say, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll try things your way. And here's what true humility looks like. True humility is proven by both our posture and our practices. What's crazy to me in this story is you've got these two polar opposite people living two polar opposite lifestyles, and they each have one piece of the pie. The Pharisee had all of the right practices. He did the right things. He went to church. He studied the Bible. He gave his tithe. 
He fasted, like he, he did the things that God would tell us to do that are going to help our soul. But somewhere along the line, his posture got off and his heart did not stay grounded in God. The tax collector, on the other hand, was making terrible life choices and everybody hated him. Everybody looked down upon him and he was filled with shame and guilt. He had all the wrong practices, but yet he had the right posture. And that's what God honored was the right posture. And, and really, though, true humility is the balance of both to say, God, I, I need you to develop within me the right posture. I want to have the right humility. But it's proven by how you and I practice and how we live out our faith. By not just showing up to church, right, but by following Jesus all day long every day. By letting his Holy Spirit lead me in the big miracle moments and the small mundane moments. Holy Spirit, you take the lead in this meeting, right? Holy Spirit, you take the lead because um, I've got no more patience at the end of my day with my family. Holy Spirit, the, the little things. We, we were talking the other day about our friend up in Virginia. She's like, Lord, you help me find what groceries to buy today so I can know. Like, like we kind of kind of laugh at her about that because she's a little quirky. We love her to death. <laughs> but like, man, what if we literally approached every single thing we did with God? Would you, hey, you help me do this. Which, which gas station do I stop at today? Because maybe, maybe he wants you to talk to somebody at that gas station. And it's not about saving three cents a gallon, but it's about the person he wants us to interact with, right? Like, what if we lived in such a humble posture that was like every waking second, it's both practice and posture, everything we do and how we live. And that is what a true, humble person looks like. And so if we can come back to where we started with the Pharisees, the modern-day Pharisees, I, I, I tried to come up with the opposite version of what a humble follower of Jesus would look like. So we started with this one, that Pharisees think being a Christian is proven by just showing up to church, right? But humble followers of Jesus know that being a Christian is proven by both our posture and our practices. It's who we are internally, but it's also backed up by how we live. And there's a, there's a balance there. And I don't have it all figured out. I don't, it's not a science, but it's, 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 an art, it's a balance of following Jesus. And that's what a humble person realizes. It's like, I can just live in grace and just blow up my life if I want to try that. Sure, have fun with that. Have fun cleaning up a mess all the time. Or I can humble myself and I can follow the way of Jesus and I can practice that out. Pharisees practice their faith to try and impress people is what we said before. Look at me. That's why I come to church. That's why I do this. That's why I do that. But a humble follower of Jesus practices their faith because their life depends on it. If I don't follow the way of Jesus, I'm going to blow something up. I'm going to be miserable. I'm not going to have his spirit. I'm not going to have his wisdom. I'm not going to have his, um, his forgiveness if I'm not, if I'm not uh, asking. Like, I, I won't have those things. That's what a humble person, a Pharisee knows what to say, right? But they don't do what they say. But a humble follower of Jesus will strive to speak and live the right way. But when they don't, they repent. It's like, I blew that one up. I'm sorry. Right? Which is what the next one continues on. Oh, no, it comes back in a minute, but we'll keep going. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Pharisees let their opinions, traditions, and politics determine how they interpret the Bible. Right? I'm going to be, yeah. <laughs> that one says a lot. Pharisees let those things have that. And that's like, I'm going to view the lens through my, I'm going to view the Bible through my lens as a Republican. Can I just say that? Because that's some, I just know our area and what we got to wrestle with. Now, maybe there's some Democrats in the room. I don't know. But it's a voting year, so y'all better believe we're talking about voting later on this year. Because God talked about it. Jesus talked about it. It matters. And have your political opinions. That's great. Vote and do your thing. But this is backwards. Instead, a humble follower of Jesus lets the Bible determine how they interpret their opinions, their traditions, and their politics. That's how it's ordained. We are not first an American. We are first citizens of his kingdom. And we've got to be reminded of that. Pharisees lack love for people in need, but humble followers of Jesus, they are eager to serve those in need. God, help at the gas station today. Which gas station? Who do you want me to pray for today? Who do you want me to show love to today? Which aisle at the grocery store so I can be kind and smile and tell them thank you and Jesus loves you? I'm eager to serve people who are hurting, who are in need. Pharisees forgive themselves, but never forget other people's past, right? We're going to hold on to that small town story forever. I got an amen for that one earlier because it's so true. But humble followers of Jesus, they forgive others and forget their past mistakes. And really they do that because that's what God does with us. And 
Aren't you grateful that God forgives and then forgets about what we've done and where we've been? I know I am. Pharisees cover up sin instead of confessing and repenting. But humble followers of Jesus are quick to confess, apologize, and then repent. That's what a humble person does. I, man, I blew that one up. Will you? I need a second chance. God, will you? Friends, coworkers, spouse, even kids, and as parents, we should be the models for asking for forgiveness. We should be the ones that say, hey, buddy, I'm, I'm sorry. Daddy blew that one up. I, hey, I, I shouldn't have done this. Uh, we got to model that to our kids. Somebody's got to lead in that way. And we show humility by how we ask for forgiveness. Pharisees get angry and offended. How dare you point that out in my life, right? But humble followers of Jesus, we welcome feedback because they know they have blind spots. And if I don't have somebody tell me, hey, man, you know, who's going to tell me that? Like, we welcome that because out of love, hopefully they're giving that to us. And so we welcome the feedback. We welcome the, hopefully, hopefully it's handled well when they give us the feedback, right? But we welcome it. And I heard this a long time ago. When people throw stones at you, you pick up the stone, you look at it, and then you let it go. Meaning when somebody gives you some criticism, some helpful feedback, it doesn't help to put it in your backpack and carry it along with you. You look at the feedback, huh, you consider it, you give it wisdom, you ask a godly counsel, you pray about it, then you set it down. You cannot let it weigh you down, just as a side note, okay? But we welcome it because we know we need people in our life who lovingly are correcting us and lovingly helping us to look more like Jesus. That's what humble followers are used to. Pharisees don't repent of sin because they don't believe they have any serious sins to turn from. But humble followers of Jesus know repenting from sin is a daily need because they are full of sin. In our flesh, that's where we live. And so it's a daily thing. And so it's like, I, I've got to do that. It is necessary for me to be constantly repenting and turning. Pharisees read the Bible to learn from something or to check off a to-do list, not to be formed into looking like Jesus. But humble followers of Jesus read the Bible so they can be formed into looking and living like Jesus. That's why we have the Bible, so we can know God's word, know his wisdom, know his way, and we can be shaped. And it's not a fictional story just to learn and read and, okay, feel better about. It's something that changes who we are. That is the power of Scripture. That is the power of Scripture. And that is what a humble follower of Jesus does. Now, a couple application points, and I'm going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come on up as we get ready to close out. So number one, what do we do? We ask God to, to help you worry more about yourself and less about other people. That's what a humble posture is. Like, God, help me because I am, it's way more fun to judge other people. It's way more fun to be concerned about other people. And, and at the heart of that, that's never helpful. And so if this is you today, if you closer to the Pharisee side of things, your heart and your prayer, it should be about asking God to help you and help, help, asking God to help me worry less about others and worry more about me. And if I'll do that, the good things will come. If I will care more about, am I following on my face before Jesus today? Am I following after him today? Good things will come. Better things will happen. I can't, and that's also just a reminder, like, we can't control other people, right? Who can we control? So I'm trying to tell my kids, you control you. You're in charge of you. You're not in charge of your brother. Don't worry about him. You're in charge of you, Okay. And so for you and I, it's that, it's that daddy to son or daughter talk, like, hey, just as a reminder, you're in charge of you, and, and we don't need to worry about other people's business, okay? So less about them and more about what God is trying to teach us and show us and grow us. Number two, use gratitude as the antidote to your pride. So I, I think when we live in a state of gratitude, man, God, you are so good. You forgave me for when I did this, and you know, I've moved on beyond that season, and I don't, I'm not here anymore, and I'm not there anymore. That begins to, it helps us live not out of pride, but out of humility, because it's like, I realize God's done everything for me anyways. And instead of living out of pride for me, I live out of gratitude, and it helps me love others, because it's, it's never about me. It's about what God did in me, how God provided for me. And so gratitude is an antidote to our pride. How can I be worried about other people when I'm just so grateful for what God's done for me because I'm so undeserving? 
and God will begin to shift our hearts so we live out of a place out of gratitude. It, it, changes, it changes us. And lastly, again, I don't, like, I'm trying to hit all points of the room today. If you relate closer to the tax collector, I would encourage you spend time with God so you can live out the practices that will then produce a humble posture. So it's two things, right? Time with God. Now, not just reading the Bible, but yes, reading the Bible, but praying with Him, speaking with Him, worshiping Him. Time in His presence alone, quiet meditation, just no noise. You fight for that time. Everything else is fighting for our attention. Fight for that time to care for your soul. And when we spend time with God, what happens? We, we live these practices and then it produces something within us. It changes us. It changes our, our heart. It changes our mind. That is how we have to live. We can hold on to things and keep trying our way. That's fine. But the better way, the better option as God said, hey, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. If you'll trust me on this, and that happens, we only know his thoughts and his ways if we actually spend time with him. If I can't spend time with him, I can't get to know him. I can't be changed by him. And so that, that has to come with time. That has to come with habits. That has to come with practices. And, and again, some maybe going back to this idea of this, this Pharisee. He was fasting. And that's great, but he missed the point. And so, so, but, but maybe somebody in this room needs to fast. Maybe God's like wanting to radically change you. It's like, hey, why don't you not eat for a week? And instead of eating, spend time with me. I don't know. Spend time with God in a new and different way. And as the reminder, as the reminder for us, as we get ready to close out in worship, that Jesus died for both the Pharisee and the tax collector. And so maybe today you're sitting here full of shame and guilt because you are a hypocritical judger of other people. Maybe you're full of shame and guilt because you've blown up your life and no one loves you and you feel unworthy and, and uh, you're overlooked and uh, you're that struggler, you're the tax collector. I don't know. Maybe you're somewhere in between. It probably all resonate a little bit with both. But what I'm telling you is we have to be reminded that Jesus died for both of those people. Jesus came to free both of those people. Jesus came to the cross three days later, empty tomb for both of those people. And so no matter where you are, you are not too far gone for God to show up and show his love for your life. That if though, if you will humble yourself, if you and I will humble ourselves and turn to God and we will seek his face, right? He will meet us there. He will show up there. That's what he honors. That's what he loves is a humble heart that has a posture that's towards him. And that requires something new from us to humble ourselves and say, hey, you, you've got this figured out. And your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. So I am going to tomorrow morning, instead of trying things my way and scrolling on social media for 15 minutes while I lay in bed, maybe I'll open the Bible app and read that for 15 minutes while I lay in bed. Maybe instead of listening to music in the car, um, I will listen to worship music or I'll sit in silence and, dare I say, pray in the car for 15 minutes. Right? Maybe instead of doing this, I'll do that. You try a new thing. Trying something new to begin to develop a, a practice, to develop the posture of your heart where God is trying to grow and stretch because he wants good things for us. He's the good farmer, the good father who's trying to help our souls reap good things. But where are we going to sow our time, our energy, and our life? Would you guys stand with me as we get ready to sing? Father, you are good. We are unworthy. You show love whether we are the tax collector or the Pharisee. God, as we sing, would we be reminded of that truth and that reality? And God, for the person that is desperate for a change in this room, would they do something to show that desperation? God, would you show love and grace and forgiveness? Would they, would they feel that today, that, that they're the tax collector that's blown some things up, but yet they know that you died for them, that you gave life, your life for them? that you have purpose for them still, that you are not done with them yet. God, would we be reminded of that? We, are, we live out of gratitude. You are so good to us. We are so unworthy. So God, we're, we're gonna begin to do something new, to have a new posture formed within us. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name.